Good evening, everybody. How are we doing? Doing well, Professor. How's it going? Doing well. Trying to stay out of the heat. Which is kind of hard when I made a visit to Adelanto today. It's a little roasty toasty up there. Did you have a sight walk? Uh, in a matter of speaking, we have a fabrication plant up in Adelanto where we do precast concrete. And it's also where we do testing. So I was up there today to do some low testing on concrete. So testing is always fun, but it got a little hot. I believe it. It was hot in Glendale today. I was, I walked out of the office to go grab lunch and I was sweating after like five minutes. Yeah. Yeah. And I hear tomorrow's going to be even funner. Still got a few people coming in here. Okay. Uh, tonight we have uh, a full agenda. We have a, a packed lecture. But uh, before we get started on the lecture, first of all, just a quick reminder that we should be well into chapter four with our text reading at this point, uh, or at least starting chapter four for beam design. And uh, let's see, let me bring up my syllabus real quick. What else did I want to say? Chapter 4.1. Uh, oh, and homework one, just a reminder, homework one is due just before midnight tonight. So before we get started with our action-packed agenda, does anybody have any questions they'd like to ask me? All righty, hearing none, let's get started. So we're going to start this discussion with a little topic of load and resistance factors. I've uh, alluded to them in the first couple of lectures. Now we're going to actually nail down what these load and resistance factors are. So here is a diagram that uh, illustrates how load factors and resistance factors are based on statistical probabilities. Right, so they did all kinds of studies for, this is mainly ASCE, American Society of Civil Engineers, did a whole bunch of statistical studies and created uh, these different types of charts like this. What you're looking at is a classic bell curve. So if Q is your load or your load demand, then the probability of Q being close to what you think it is, is related to this bell curve. So one standard deviation to the right and one standard deviation to the left, I believe encapsulates 67% of all the random samplings that you would have. And then two standard deviations to the left and to the right, I think capture something like 90%. So what this is basically saying is if I design for a load Q, there's a certain probability that Q is gonna actually be bigger than what I thought it would be, just as there's a probability that Q might be lower than what I had assumed it to be. Okay, and that also depends on what kind of load we're talking about. Sources of load that are well-defined like dead load have a smaller load factor than do load sources that are poorly defined or live load. So the bell curve gets skinnier with well-defined loads and it gets much fatter with poorly defined loads. And similarly, we have R is our resistance distribution. And so in a very similar way, uh, Q there's a uh, probability, there's a static um, statistical analysis of what the load may be based on what we think it is. Just the same, if we think that the strength is going to be R, there's this statistical probability that it might be somewhat less than R, it may be somewhat more than R, 
depending on material properties or workmanship or all kinds of different factors. Structural capacities that are well understood, reliable, and uh, ductile in nature, like flexural bending, will have a higher resistance factor than those that are poorly understood and can lead to a sudden or brittle failure, like a column compression or shear. So what this is showing, again, the idea is that I want to design my system to have a capacity greater than the load, right? So, I mean, that's obvious. You always want your beam to be stronger than the loads that you intend to put on that beam. But how much stronger should that beam be than the loads you plan to put on it? And that's what this graph is illustrating. So if I design for a load effect Q and I provide a beam strength R, is R enough greater than Q? And so you look at the statistical probability. Uh, if uh, the if you're, what you're designing is very well understood, like flexural bending, then this uh, distribution is going to be fairly narrow. There's not going to be a lot a wide variance from what you think it should be. If the load is well understood, this is going to be somewhat narrow. If the load is not very well understood, this is going to be somewhat wide. But Look at this area down here. And what this is basically saying is that there's always some probability. It may be significant. It may be massively improbable. It may be so insignificant. But there is always some probability that the load is going to be so much bigger than you thought it would be at the same time that your capacity is so much less than what you thought it would be. If these two curves overlap, what you have in here is a collapse or a failure. If your capacity is way down here, but your load effect is still way over here, well, then you're okay. If your load effect is way out over here, but your capacity is closer to what you think it is, you're okay. It's only where these two overlap that you have a failure. For some reason, the beam is somewhat weaker than you thought, and at the same concurrent time, the load is somewhat larger than what you thought. And where these overlap, you have a failure. So what ASCE did is they looked at the probabilities of all these different things. And they, I, mean, I don't know how they did this. They must've did some kind of feasibility studies and looked at 15,000 beams and case studies and testing. And it was probably a massive undertaking. But what they did is they decided that there's, what is the maximum allowable probability that these are going to overlap? It's got to be a really small number, but it can't be zero because you can't have zero probability really of anything. But it can make it an acceptably small number. And then they went back and figured out, well, how much do we need to amplify the load? And how much do we need to reduce the capacity to make this acceptably small? And so this is just a very quick layman's look at how we got to load factors and how we got to resistance factors. Okay, any questions on that concept? Okay, ACI 318 section 531 and table 531 give the required load combinations as 1.4D, 1.2D plus 1.6L plus 0.5 of LR or S or R. And, and I'll cover what each one of these D, L, L, R, all of these, I'll cover those in a second, what they stand for. Or you could be 1.2D plus 1.6 LR or S or R plus 1.0 times L or 
0.5 times w. So you really have to go through and evaluate all these different combinations to see which is the highest. We could also have 1.2d plus 1.0w plus 1.0l plus 0.5 lr or s or r. Or 1.2d, 1.0e plus 1.0l plus 0.2s or 0.9d plus 1.0w or 0.9d plus 1.0e. Those are the load factors. Again, whichever one causes the greatest effect for whatever it is you're trying to design, that's the one that controls. So where u is the factored load effect. U may represent bending as mu or shear as vu, torsion as tu, axial compression as pu, and so on and so forth. So remember what we said last time, the M or the V or the T or the P designates what you're designing for, bending, compression, shear, and then the little U always stands for the factored load effect of that type of load. Okay, so what does each one of these little symbols stands for? D, start with D. D is the self-weight of a structure and any permanently attached architectural components, mechanical units, plumbing, electrical, et cetera. Basically, D is anything built into the building or nailed down or screwed into the building that you cannot easily remove or shift around. That's the dead load. L stands for live load. Live load effect to account for transient loading of the structure, including occupants, furniture, traffic, etc. Live loads are prescribed by ASCE 7. Live loads may be reduced per ASCE 7 Chapter 4. Again, ASCE, American Society of Civil Engineers, you get into structural engineering. Not only do you have to buy ACI 318, you also have to buy ASCE 7. There's all kinds of stuff in this document that you need to use this document. It's so much fun. So what is live load? Live load is basically in a building, everything that's not dead load, anything that can move around. So like I said, your furniture, your you, you, your bodies, your buddies, your students, your teachers, anything and everything in a building that is not nailed down is live load. Well, how could you possibly even begin to estimate what your live load is going to be? You're not going to be walking around asking everybody, hey, uh, how much do you weigh? Uh, okay, all right. Uh, so I'll add that to I'll add the Sally. How much does Joe weigh? No, there, there's you. the buildings typically have a 30 to 50 year lifespan. You're not going to have a clue who's going to be in your building during its lifetime. So we have to go back to ASCE 7. And what ASCE 7 has done is also done all kinds of studies to correlate different occupancies to different live loads. For example, a parking garage, you know, like the big parking garage out there in uh, at Cal Poly, uh, the one that a lot of you have never used because <laughs> it's been a year and a half now. But that parking garage, what do we design the live load? All right, so we don't know if people are going to be driving in there with smart cars or F-250 full-size pickup trucks with camper shells on them. We have no idea. So ASCE 7 did studies. They looked at all kinds of different parking garages and they took all kinds of averages. For every full-size pickup truck, how many uh, sedans are there? That sort of thing. And then they whittled it down to an average number, and then they just rounded it up to be conservative. So we design parking garages for 40 pounds per square foot. And we just go to ASCE 7, look it up in the book, and say 40 pounds per square foot. That's what I design parking garages to. 
I don't have to do any kind of statistical studies myself. I don't have to have a clue what kind of parking vehicles are going to be in there as long as they are light duty personal passenger type vehicles, right? So if you're going to be putting buses, shuttles, dump trucks, cement trucks, that's totally different. That's a totally different loading. You, that is not what's intended for a parking garage, but for just regular cars, 40 pounds a square foot. Uh, office buildings, uh, office buildings, 50 pounds a square foot. Um, what about uh, like uh, lobbies or where you have a lot of people congregating, like you're waiting for the elevator or you're waiting for stairwells? What do I design for a lot of people? Again, I'm, I can't go around and start interviewing people and asking them what they weigh. That would be somewhat inappropriate. So I go to ACE7, I look it up and oh, well, where people may be congregating is a hundred pounds per square foot, right? And isn't that amazing that it's two and a half times more than where you park your cars. So that's what live load is. Any questions? Okay, uh, L sub R refers to roof live load. And roof live load is uh, generally a lot less than floor live load. And it is the load effect to account for transient loading and maintenance personnel or other transient roof loads, planters, etc. Prescribed by ASCE 7, roof live loads may be reduced per ASCE 7 chapter 4. So usually roof live loads are much, much less than live loads because in a lot of cases, the only one on the roof is the guy cleaning the solar panels or the person uh, using the davits and lowering themselves in the little thingy to you know, clean windows, you know, basically things like that. If you have a roof that is intended to host parties or congregations or assemblies, well, that would be totally different. You'd have to design that for the 100 pounds per square foot. But for just regular everyday roofs, it's usually uh, 20 reducible down to 12. Uh, I could say most of your housing, most of you who live in houses, your roofs were probably designed for somewhere between 12 and 20 pounds a square foot. S stands for snow load. A snow load is a semi-transient load. It may be there for a few months if you live in any other state but ours. It's kind of funny talking about snow loads when it's 108 out, huh? But there are parts of California where we do have to design for snow loads. Uh, I've had to do that in cities like Big Bear and Lake Arrowhead, um, South Lake Tahoe on the California side. I had to design for 150 pounds per square foot live load at one time or I think that equated to like seven feet of snow or something like that. But it is a semi-transient load due to snow, does not apply in all locations like here. We're never gonna design for snow down here. Uh, can be the primary load effect for roof structures. Procedure to determine snow loads is found in chapter seven of ASCE 7. Way beyond the scope of this class, chapter seven is a really complicated deal now where you calculate not only what the snow loading can be, but then there's all kinds of stuff in there about uh, snow drifts and how it can really pile up in some places. R stands for rain load and rain load is prescribed by chapter eight of ASCE seven, primarily required for ponding checks. And, um, you wouldn't think rain would really be a big deal, but what's interesting is that uh, flat roofs, you know, not, uh, not gabled roofs or hip roofs like on many houses, but uh, flat roofs where uh, you have uh, like an asphalt type roofing material and you have roof drains to get the water off and all that, probably more roofs have been collapsed because the roof drains clogged up 
and the rainwater start piling up on the roof. Because what happens, a ponding, what is ponding? Ponding is you start with a flat roof. The drains back up and the next thing you know, you got one inch of water on your roof. Well, the weight of one inch of water maybe causes your roof to deflect one inch. Well, now you got two inches of water. Well, two inches of water makes your roof deflect two inches. Now you have three inches of water. Sometimes they don't catch themselves and they will actually collapse from the, the more deflection, the more water, the more water, the more deflection. And sometimes they don't catch themselves. So that's what the rain load is about. W stands for a wind load. Load effect to account for the transient loading from wind. Wind is primarily a lateral load, but it can cause uplift due to negative pressure. Lateral force resisting systems must be designed for shear, overturning moments, and uplift on the system. Wind is prescribed by ASCE 7 chapters 26 through 31. That gives you a clue how complicated designing for wind may be. And E, something near and dear to our hearts here, earthquake load. This is a load effect to account for the transient loading from earthquakes. E is primarily a lateral load, but also has a vertical component that can affect the structural members, not part of lateral force resisting system. Earthquake loading is prescribed by ASCE 7 chapters 11 through 23, even more complicated. So, Calculating these load effects is beyond the scope of this class. We have more than enough to chew on in our 10-week uh, accelerated version of the class. So if I'm going to do anything with wind or earthquake loads in this class, they're just going to be given to you. Uh, we're not going to go through the exercise of calculating these. We have some other sources of load. T stands for restraint. And restraint is a load effect to account for structural restraint from volume changes, shrinkage, temperature, et cetera, and differential settlement. It is prescribed by a ACI 318.536 and ASCE 7, section 234. We just had, by the way, we just had a, a pretty significant problem on a parking garage that was just erected not too long ago, where the outside of the parking garage has hanging from it this really nice stainless steel trellis system. It's all architectural. It was all just there for uh, an architectural effect, really. But the designer of the lattice work, and it was all stainless steel, tube steel, and the designer of it had the connections of this to our concrete building as super rigid, hard and fast at embed plates uh, about 20 feet apart. And then we got the call not too long ago that said, hey, uh, Clark Pacific, your embeds are failing. Something has happened to your embeds. They're ripping out of the concrete. You need to come fix this. And it turns out we didn't do anything wrong. Uh, what happened was the designer of the stainless steel trellis system did not account for temperature effects. So they installed these trellises on a nice hot day, like 85 degrees that day, 90 degrees that day. And of course they're welding, which makes it even hotter. And then they just let it cool. And then once we got into the winter months, which seems like eons ago, but when we got through the colder winter months, that steel trellis cooled down to the point where it shrunk and it ripped the embeds right out of the concrete. Didn't account for restraint. F stands for a fluid load. Load effect to account for the weight or pressure of fluids on the structure prescribed by ACI 537 and ASCE 7231. So this is different than brain load. This is like the actual fluid, like uh, a water tank, a swimming pool. Um, if you're building some sort of a water retention facility, a dam, for example, then that's what this would be. 
H stands for lateral earth pressure. This is a load effect to account for the lateral pressure exerted by soil loading. Mostly you'll see this in retaining walls prescribed by ACI 318.538 and ASCE 7231. And we have a flood load, F sub A, load effect due to flooding. This is rather obscure. And wind on ice, talk about obscure. <laughs> this accounts for atmospheric icing prescribed by ACI 318.5310 and ASCE 7233 in chapter 10. This is kind of a weird one, but what this is, is you can get an atmospheric condition where it's below freezing, but there's moisture in the air. And so just like a crystal starts with a seed, you could have uh, ice starting on um, trees or on uh, power lines on the eave of your roof, stuff like that. And so as the ice starts building, it's like a seed, it keeps growing. And so you start getting these massive formations of ice all over the place. And then when the wind blows, all of a sudden it's blowing against all that ice that didn't exist when you were designing your structure for wind, uh, particularly like a uh, power tower or uh, one of the uh, truss towers supporting the power lines. These could be really susceptible to growing a whole bunch of icicles all over the thing. And then the wind hits that and there's way more surface area for the wind to act on than when there's no ice. Clearly not a problem for us here, but uh, places like Michigan or really just about anywhere but here, this could be a real problem. Okay, the seismic load effect E is actually two parts. We have an E sub V and an E sub H to account for vertical and horizontal accelerations. This came out of the Northridge earthquake. E sub H is dictated by ASCE 7 chapters 11 and 12 and is resisted by the lateral force resisting system, usually shear walls or moment frames. The design of shear walls and moment frames is outside the scope of this class. And so E sub H will not be looked at at this time. E sub V is the vertical acceleration due to seismic and it, it is applied to the lateral force resystem as well as to the gravity system. So E sub V is prescribed by ASCE 7 12422 as 0 0.2 SDS times the dead load. So really what this is, is again, picture like a concrete parking garage. When an earthquake hits, clearly this, this garage is trying to be jolted to the left and to the right. And those uh, inertial forces, lateral forces are being re resisted by a moment frame or a shear wall. But there's also a little bit of up and down movement going on. And if you accelerate all that mass of the parking garage up, well, what goes up must come back down. When it comes down, it is accelerating the mass more than gravity. So it's, it's actually amplifying the weight of the structure and it could be quite significant. So this is ESA V is, to, is prescribed as 20% of this SDS factor times the dead load. Where SDS is the design spectral acceleration parameter given by ASCE 7, 1145. This value is required to be calculated and reported on the structural drawing. So any structural design, that SDS factor is on your cover sheet of that building's design. And for us here, this is somewhere around 1.2 to 1.5, depending on how close you are to seismic faults and where you are in the LA area. Uh, I've seen it as high as 1.8, 1.9, and I've seen it as low as forgettable, <laughs> like 0 0.1, 0 0.2 in other parts of the country. If needed for this class, I will provide you with the SDS factor. We're not gonna get into trying to figure out how to do that. 
if EV is substituted back into the design combinations, it looks like the 1.2 times dead plus the 0.2 SDS. So we just add these two together times dead. And then this load combination only uses a 1.0 times the live plus 0.2 if you have any snow loading. You can also have where the S or the seismic is an uplift. Instead of pushing everything down, it's actually pushing stuff up. So if it's trying to push stuff up, then you use the 0.9 times the dead load. So it's 0.9 minus 0.2. It gives you a pretty small fraction of the total dead load. And in some cases, this may control. Thus, for concrete design and the purposes of this class, the controlling load factors generally will be 1.4 dead, 1.2 dead plus 1.6 live, or 1.2 plus 0.2 SDS dead, and 1.0 live. These are the three load combinations that we use at my office most often. You have to run through all three of them to determine which one controls for what you're designing. If loads are given as U loads, like MU, VU, et cetera, then those loads are already factored. You can just go ahead and design using those loads. If the loads are given as something, something D, plus something something L, for example, then these loads must be factored for strength design. You're, you are looking at a service level load if it has a dead and a live. So you need to factor them before you can compare them for strength design. But if you're doing service checks like deflections or cracking, we'll cover that later. But if, if you are doing a service level check, then you would leave them as a service level load where you have a dead load and a live load component. Okay, uh, that's a lot of material. Any questions? No questions, um, just a quick second. Um, so, Professor, in this, the SDAs in our case will always be given, right? Yes. Okay, because yeah. I am familiar with this one when I took uh, structural design. Yeah. And yeah, the ASC7 as well. Yeah, yeah. So this all ties together. I mean, if you took a structural theory class or you take a steel class, I mean, it's all the same material. I'm just not sure who's seen this before and who hasn't. Uh, but for the purposes of this class, if I do not give you an SDS, then just assume this equation does not control, just check the two that you can check. If I do give you an SDS, then I'm looking for you to check all three. Does that make sense? Yeah, and then compare all three, right? Yes. Which one is the highest, okay. Whichever one is the highest. Yep. Yeah. Okay, thank you. All right. Well, that's load factors. Now let's talk about resistance factors. This is uh, known as phi. This is a phi factor, uh, P H I, phi factor. Okay, so phi factors are used to account for defects in material strengths, defects in workmanship consequences of failure. And they are prescribed by ACI 318 chapter 21 and table 21 to one. So they're not just based on the statistical probability that it's actually gonna be less strong than you think it is, or that what are the odds of a construction defect of uh, it was supposed to be 20 inches deep. They only made it 18 inches deep. Oops. You know, so this is really to handle any oops in the field. And this is to handle any oops from the materials. But there's also this consequences of failure. And this is really important too. So if a beam in bending fails, as we said before, there's going to be a lot of cracking. 
there's going to be little pieces of concrete falling out. There's going to be a lot of deflection. There's going to be a lot of opportunity for somebody to go, that don't look good. I think I'm going to leave now. But the consequences of failure of, say, a concrete column, when it fails, there is no warning. Uh, a concrete column that fails in compression, there is no warning. The, the whole bottom of the column would just blow out instantly, dropping all the floors above it. You can see that would be much, much more devastating than one beam that is failing uh, with lots of warning, right? So the fee factor for a beam and bending is a lot higher than the fee factor for a column that might fail in compression, okay? So this is also a big driver as to why some fee factors are lower and some are higher. All right. So if you have moment, axial force, or a combination of moment and axial force, the fee factor can actually range from 0.65, this is for a column mostly in compression, to 0.9, with this is for a beam mostly in flexure based on epsilon sub t, okay? So uh, where you fall on the phi factor scale depends on epsilon sub t. If epsilon sub t is less than 0, 0, 005, then like we talked about, phi is calculated with this expression. If epsilon t is greater than 0, 0, 005, then phi is equal to 0.9. And this applies whether you're designing a column or a beam, doesn't matter. It's all based on the strain condition of the rebar when the concrete fails. If you have a pre-stress member, phi then varies linearly with the strand development at the ends of the member, kind of outside the scope of this class, but just to be aware that normally pre-stress beams are 0.9, but they can drop to 0.75 at the end of the beam if you don't have any development on your strand. Shear is a whole different category. So this is moment, axial force, or combined. Now we're talking shear. Shear is 0.75. Torsion, also 0.75. Bearing, uh, this is where you check against a bearing failure. V is 0.65. Post-tension anchorage zones, and this is rather specific, but this is the concrete under the steel plates that are used to anchor post-tensioning. That fee is 0.85. Corbels are 0.75. Uh, a corbel is a very short beam that is projecting off the side of a column or a wall, and it supports some structural element. So they're very much shear driven. Uh, so they have the 0.75. Strut and tie designs are also outside the scope of this class. But if you do strut and tie designs, V is 0.75. Uh, ductile connections of precast. So you have precast concrete connecting to precast concrete with rebar in between. That's 0.9. Plain concrete. You actually can design plain concrete, no rebar whatsoever. Don't know why anybody would want to do that, but you can do that. You have this very low fee factor to account for. You don't get a whole lot of strength out of plain concrete. Anchors into concrete. This would be like bolts or wedge anchors or epoxy anchors, that sort of thing. Fee depends, but it can go from 0.45 which is pretty severe, to 0.75. ACI 318 2124 modifies the fee value for special moment frames, special structural walls or shear walls, and indeterminate or intermediate precast structural walls. ACI 318 21241 modifies the fee value from shear to 0.6 for any member designed to resist seismic loads if the nominal shear strength is less than required to develop the nominal moment strength. If you have anything resisting earthquakes 
And if that something, column, wall, beam, whatever, if that something can fail and shear before it develops plastic hinging and flexure, then you have to use this 0.6 factor. They don't want things failing in shear. ACI 21242 modifies the fee factor for shear for diaphragms to the least value used for shear of the lateral force resisting system. So again, you have a shear wall and its shear strength is less than what would be required to fully develop the plastic um, flexural strength of the member, then that shear wall has to use a fee of 0.6. If you use the 0.6 value for any of your shear walls, then your diaphragm also has to be designed for 0.6. ACI 212343 modifies the fee factor for shear to 0.85 for diagonally reinforced coupling beams. Okay, that was a lot of information. Uh, any questions? Professor, can you go back two slides, please? There? Yes. Let me know when you're good. Okay, that's good. I, I just needed to copy the last. Okay. All right. Okay. All right. So what we have covered is the concept of load factor and resistance design. We factor the loads. We knock down the capacities of our uh, capacities with uh, resistance factors. So we have load factors to bring the loads up and we have fee factors to bring the strength down. And as long as the reduced strength is still greater than the factored load, then the design is adequate. If the reduced strength is, or allowable strength, is less than the factored load, it is unacceptable. And we need to put, provide more strength, okay? So that's what we've done so far today. Now what we're gonna do is look at beam design and the design of rectangular beams. The analysis of beams determine the capacity of a beam where all design elements are known, including, so we know the strength of concrete, F prime C. We know the strength of the steel, Fy. We know the depth, either we know the height of the beam or we know D, distance to the steel. We know the width of the beam. We know the area of steel. So if we know all of these five things, then we're not designing a beam. We're just doing a beam analysis to figure out what the capacity is. The design of a beam is when all design elements are not known. Then we determine design values for the missing elements. So if any one of these things is unknown, we need to design that beam. If only one design element is missing, then one unique solution exists and can be solved for. So if you know everything except the area of steel, then we have techniques to solve for the area of steel. And there's one right answer. But if we don't know the, say, the depth of the beam or the area of steel, and these would be really common. So I don't know how deep the beam is, I don't know how much steel we have, then we actually have an infinite number of solutions. You can make the beam with a really small amount of steel and make the beam 10 feet deep, or you can make the beam with a huge amount of steel and the beam's only 30 inches deep or anywhere in between. There's an infinite number of solutions. So in those cases, if more than one design element is missing, then an infinite solutions may exist. Guides or rules of thumb must be used to reduce 
the unknowns, to get it to one workable solution. And here are some of the guides or rules of thumb. Beam height can be approximated by ACI 318, 9311, and table 9311. Those give you some good uh, ballparks for beam depths. Uh, generally, they are based on the span of the beam, right? So uh, there'll be something like uh, H is equal to L over 20. So if L is 30 feet, then you would go 30 times 12 is 360 inches divided by 20. All right, so my beam should be around 18 inches deep or, or more. So those are some guides. They're just rules of thumb. Beam width minimum can be approximated by the textbook table 8.5. That's the one that based on the steel that you want to use, you can approximate how wide the beam has to be to accommodate that steel. The beam depth can be approximated as one and a half to two times the beam width, but it's just a rule of thumb. It could be narrower for deeper beams. And beam depth generally specified, oh, okay, let me, let me slow down here. Beam depth can be approximated as one and a half to two times the beam width. But when you are deciding how deep to make the beam, Beam depth is generally specified in one or two inch increments, okay? So you're not gonna specify a beam depth of 29 and a quarter inches. You're gonna say, make it 30 or make it 28. Beam widths are generally specified in two to three inch increments. So you're not gonna specify a 17 and three quarter inch wide beam. You're gonna make it 18 or 20, okay? So there's some kind of guidelines to choosing a height and a width based on this. The reinforcement ratio rho can be approximated by a desired target, such as rho is equal to 0.18 F prime C over Fy, or you can target for an epsilon sub T greater than or equal to 0075, for example. But let me point out something. This is something that uh, my students have uh, made this assumption and uh, kind of went down the wrong road. If I give you a target, say I give you a problem where you don't know the depth and you don't know the area of steel. So you've got two things that are missing. And I say, I want you to target epsilon sub t greater than or equal to 0075. So this is your target. Well, I'm doing that because when I'm grading homeworks, I can't grade 35 different, completely different answers. So I want everybody to be aiming for the same answer. That's really just a tool to guide everybody to the same answer. Or if I say, Rho should be equal to 0.18 F prime C or Fy. Again, that's just trying to guide everybody in the class to the same answer. And if I give you these as a target, well, then that, that's fine. Use that for that target. But here's the point. These targets are only, only applicable to that problem. These are not general at all. This target may be applicable to homework problem number three. But when we get to the midterm and I ask you to design something, you can't use this because I didn't give it to you for the midterm. I only gave it to you for homework problem number three. Same as this. So please understand that these are targets only for a specific problem to guide everybody to the same solution. You can't just pull this out of the air and say that this works every time. It most certainly does not. And sometimes the midterm will be asking you something completely different and neither of these targets are applicable in any way, shape or form. And they would actually guide you to a completely wrong answer. Am I hitting my point? 
these are only if I tell you that you I want these for that problem. Can I get an okie dokie? Yeah, I got that. Okie dokie. Fantastic. Thank you. All right. Now, we do have some other tools here. We have this uh, R sub n. Remember, that was an index. And we have this, uh, I think it's called a reinforcement index. And we have row. We can relate row and R sub n with mu over phi bd squared. And it can be used to find the required steel area once the depth and the width can be approximated, right? You can't use this equation until you have a B and a D. But once you get to an approximation, a guess for B and D, then you can use this equation to find your area of steel. The text tables 8.8 to 8.13 can be used to relate R sub n and row. As long as your problem parameters, F prime C, F Y, as long as your problem parameters fall within the parameters of the tables, then you can use those tables to quickly relate between these two values. Or you can use these equations. R sub N is equal to MU over phi BD squared is also equal to row F Y 1 minus 0.59 row Fy over F prime C. So you can go back and forth between rho and R sub n with this equation. Likewise, you can go from rho to R sub n by using this equation. Uh, 1 minus 2 Rn over 8.85 F prime C, one uh, square root, 1 minus times 0.85 F prime C Fy. So if you know Rn, you can get rho. If you know rho, you can get Rn. This is how we work back and forth between what we know and what we don't know to get to what we need. All right. So the rest of this lecture, I have four examples of how to design beams with various degrees of what we know and what we don't know. So before we jump into example number one, let's take a 10 minute break or call it an eight minute break, if we will. And let's reconvene at 6 p.m.
Hello, everybody. Hope everybody had a great break. Indeed. All right, so let's start with uh, example one. Here's the uh, schematic of the beam. The beam is nine inches wide, overall depth is 18. And the steel in this case is located 16 from the top or two inches from the bottom. What is given is uh, MDL, this stands for dead load. Um, I guess uh, the current code terminology would just be M sub D, but DL, same thing, it stands for dead load. So the moment from the dead load is 26.7 kip feet. Moment from the live load is 44.2 kip feet. The SDS factor is 1.45 for this particular project. F prime C design that we're using is 4,000 PSI. The steel is 60 KSI. And we need to find the required steel to satisfy the demand on this beam. So of the five things, we know four. We know the grade of the concrete. We know the grade of the steel. We know the depth and we know the width but we do not know the area of steel. So that's what we need to design is the area of steel. So the first step is I need to know what my factored load demand is. I don't have that. All I have is the service loads here. So we need to go through all three of the factored load combinations. The first one is 1.4 dead, which would be 1.4 times to 26.7 is 37.4. Or 1.2 dead plus 1.6 live gives me 1.2 times the 26.7 plus 1.6 times the 44.2. That's 102.8 kip feet, which is actually going to control. And we check the 1.2 plus 0.2 SDS, D plus 1.0 live, and that ends up being 84.0 kip feet. So clearly, uh, combination number two, 1.2 plus 1.6 is the controlling combination. And my factored moment, M sub U, is 102.8. So that's the load that I'm targeting. That's what I need to show that the strength of the beam is at or greater than. So now that I have M sub U, I can use my expression that relates uh, the moment to uh, the required R sub n. So R sub n is equal to the moment 102.8 converted to inches to be consistent with the others or inches. Phi is 0.9 times a width of nine times a D of 16. And that gives me 0.595 KSI. Now that I have R sub n, what I'm really after is the area of steel, which I can get from rho. So the equation that relates R sub n to rho is this equation that I just presented in the last slide. So from here, I can plug in my 4,000 PSI concrete, 60 KSI steel. My R sub n is calculated at 595 and my uh, F prime C of 4,000. And this gives me 0 0.01098. If I use the table, which I can because I have an F prime C of 4,000 and FY of 60 KSI, so I can use table A13. And the table gives me 0 0.0110, nearly identical. Uh, the table is just rounding up. Um, but just as a note, generally when you're doing these types of numbers, you wanna carry these out at least four digits, maybe five, uh, because the numbers are so small, if you round up too much, you're gonna to lose too much accuracy. All right, so therefore, the area of steel that is required is row BD. Row is 01098. B is nine, D is 16. I need 1.58 inches squared. If I choose three number sevens, then three times 0.6 is 1.8 inches squared. 
And you may be tempted, you may be tempted to say, you know what? I only need 1.58 and I'm providing 1.8. So I'm good and I'm done. On to the next homework problem. Wrong, dead wrong, absolutely wrong. And you may get one point, you may get no points. Why, why am I so harsh? Because you neglected to check the minimum steel requirement you neglected to check the maximum steel requirement, and you neglected to check that phi m n is actually greater than m u. So I'll show you all these steps. But please remember, you cannot just go here and say, I'm done. Is there a question? Yeah, I have a question for using the table. I'm looking at the table right now. And how did you get uh, 0 0.0110? Ugh. Did I get the wrong number? No, I'm uh, saying like, how do you how do you come about choosing that number? Because there's a lot of, um, I think it's page 607. Okay, okay. All right, yeah. All right, so we're on page 607. And mu over phi bd squared is that R sub n number, right? Uh, they're just listing it in PSI, so don't let that throw you. Okay. So 595.595 KSI is 595 PSI. So you go down the table, and the bottom of the first column is 330. That's not enough. I go down the second table uh, column is 542, still not enough. Go down the third column, and I get to 590.9, 595.7. You got to go to the first one that is more than what you're looking for. So the first one that's more than what you're looking for is 595.7, which oh. is more than 595. And there, right to the left of that is 0 0.0110. Okay. Yeah, I just, I guess the conversion um, got me a little bit confused and the RN, that's, that it's the same thing because they, they use a, a different, um, okay, yeah. Absolutely. And I'm very glad you asked that question. Um, so everybody else can see where we got that number from too. Uh, you're absolutely right. This is in PSI, my examples in KSI. And they list the column heading as mu over phi bd squared, which is this, but I call it r sub n. So slight terminology differences, but yes, I'm glad you asked that. That's how you use that table. Okay, so I need to check my minimum steel requirement. And that is either three square root f prime c over f y b w d, or 200 over Fy BWD, whichever is greater. I run the three square root. I get three times square root of 4,000 over 6916. I get 0 0.455 inches squared. If I run the 200, I get 200 PSI over 60 KSI 96, and that's for 0 0.48 inches squared. This one controls, it's the larger of the two. We are providing three number sevens with an area 1.8 inches squared, clearly larger than 0.48 inches squared. So this is not an issue, but you do have to check it. So that's, that's the minimum steel check. The maximum steel check is interesting because we're not gonna actually check the maximum steel. Okay, this is a little misleading. We call it the maximum steel check, but what we're actually going to check is epsilon sub t. So we're going to calculate A is ASFY over 0.85 F prime CB. Plug in your numbers, you get 3.53 inches. That's A with 4,000 psi concrete. Beta 1 is 0.85. So little c is A over point or beta one, 
So 3.53 over 0.85 is 4.15 inches. Therefore, epsilon t is 003 d minus c over c. I plug in my c. I get 00857. 00857 is greater than 005. Therefore, we are both OK, and we have a phi factor of 0.9. Why did I call this maximum steel check? I didn't even check the maximum steel at all. The answer is by calculating and checking epsilon sub t, epsilon sub t is a measure of whether or not you're under reinforced or over reinforced. If you are over reinforced, you have too much steel. So this is in a roundabout way, making sure that we have not exceeded the maximum amount of steel that the code will allow. There's another way to do this check as well though. You can use the tables. So if you choose to use the table method, then what you can do is you can go to, let me find it here real quick. Table A.7, and you go to the column with the 4,000 PSI, you go to the rows based on 60 KSI, and you see that you have this row balance, row when epsilon t is 004, 005, and 0075. The one that we want is epsilon sub t equal to 005. And so what's that number in the 4,000 and row equal to 005? What number do you see there? Is it 0 0.0181? That is correct. So the reinforcing ratio is 0 0.0181 when you have 4,000 PSI concrete, 60 KSI steel, and epsilon T is exactly 005. So that represents the most steel that you're going to want to provide, and it just barely gets you at 005. Well, how much steel is that? Well, that's a row factor, so you need to multiply rho times B times D. So that number times 9 times 16 equals 2.61 inches squared of steel. So we could, in, instead of this, we could look it up in the table and then say 2.61 is greater than what we're providing of 1.8. Therefore, we've also done a maximum steel check. But, but we, we need to find E, e sub T, yeah, epsilon T first, right? No, no, you do not. Okay. So then so, how, would, how would you know that you're using 0 0.05 or like, for example, 0 0.04? Okay, good question. Because when we do the maximum steel check, we want to make sure that we have more than 005. Remember how we could do more than 004, but then your fee has to be calculated and it, you get to a point of diminishing returns. Fee starts dropping. We don't want to be in that region. We always want to be at 005 or greater. So that's why I check this at 005. And that's the 0 0.181 number. So I want to make sure that the steel that I'm providing, 1.8, is less than 0 0.181 times 9 times 16, which is 2.61. So what I'm, what I'm saying is you can check it two completely different ways. You can do this with the table, go into the table with epsilon t equal to 0, 0.05, Get that row value, multiply times B times D, get that area of steel and compare it to the area of steel that you're providing, or do exactly what I did here and directly calculate epsilon T and confirm that that is greater than 005. They both get you to the same end result. 
Um, frankly, I prefer this because this illustrates what's actually happening instead of being buried in the table where you may be confused as to why am I using 005 as opposed to 0075. Does that make sense? Is this like the homework problem one, Professor? Uh, could be. I forgot what I asked you to do. <laughs> it's, yeah, I think it's, uh, uh, you're asking if it's under enforced or over enforced. Yeah, yeah, that, that, that's part of this as well. Yeah. Okay. And I have a question, Professor, for fee. Is it, why did you use 0.9? At Be, the here, yeah, right here, uh -huh. because this is greater than zero zero five. Oh, I mean, uh, like, go to your previous slides. I think you automatically use point nine, even though we don't know the epsilon t. Oh, okay, okay, yes, good observation, yes. Okay, you're talking about right there. Yeah, that one. Yeah, okay. That's a great question. Because, the well, the answer, the answer is we never try to design with an epsilon sub t less than 005. Sometimes, rarely, we may get forced into that category, but we never aim for that, ever. We're always aiming for a design that gives us greater than 005. So if it's greater than 005, it's 0.9. So I'm always going to assume 0.9 in this equation, because this is early in the design. And then I get down to here. And I have confirmed it. Right? Oh, so it's like, this is your checking. Yes. Okay. And that, that's exactly what it is. It's a maximum steel check. So I'm right. checking that I actually achieved greater than 005. So therefore, my fee assumption of 0.9 was correct. Oh, so the fee earlier, it's just your assumptions. Yes, but the fee earlier in the R sub n equation, mm -hmm. you always assume it's going to be 0.9 because you're never aiming for it to be anything less than 0.9 because your epsilon will be less than 0 0.005. Right, Is that right. right. Okay. Now, I, again, rarely you may get forced into a situation where you have to make it less than 0 0.005, but that's very unusual. You're always aiming for more than, and this just becomes a check. Okay, got it, thank you. Okay. All right, now the last, last but most important step, Always recheck your assumed steel for capacity, right? Again, this is the whole idea that I chose an area of steel more than required, therefore I'm good, right? Not always and not necessarily. So you have to do this last step. The last step is recheck your assumed steel for capacity. So calculate VMN. VMN is V times ASFY D minus ASFY over 1.7 F prime C B, which I plug in all my values. I got my area of steel, my grade D area of steel, grade concrete width, and I get 1384 kip inches or of 115.3 kip feet. And here is the most important line. One point or 115.3 kit feet is greater than, remember what MU was, 102.8. Therefore, the design is acceptable. Okay, so every problem, every problem, I'm looking for this last step. I am looking for you to tell me that VMN is greater than MU. You can't assume it from anything that you've done above this point. You have to actually calculate VMN and show that VMN is greater than MU before I'm your plan checker. Before I sign off on this building, I'm looking for this. VMN greater than MU. Okay, is that clear? 
Yes, sir. Okie dokie. Example number two. The example, example number two is a little different. This is designed a beam where the depth and the steel area are not known. So I don't know how much steel I have. I don't even know how deep the beam is. We're gonna assume that I'm designing to a maximum factor load of 900 kip feet, right? So I don't always have to go through the factoring of the three different combinations. Uh, I can just give you MU. If I give you MU, there's no point in trying to calculate it. I just gave it to you, right? So here we just assume that MU is 900 kip feet. And we also assume that it includes any dead load from the beam itself. Just simplifies the problem. So I'm just targeting 900. F prime C is 6,000 PSI. My steel is going to be 80 grade in this case. And so now we need a solution. So the area of steel and the effective depth are unknown. Are unknown. So there's an infinite number of solutions. You could have a little bit of steel with a big D, or you could have a lot of steel with a little D, or anything in between. So to kind of hone in on an answer, this particular one, we're going to target epsilon sub t to be equal to or greater than 0075 to get, guide our design solution. Doesn't have to end up being exactly 0075. We're just going to aim for that. And again, just because I use this on this problem doesn't mean you can ever use it again in any other problem ever again in your life. You may, you may not. So how do I use this? Well, I'm going to use my strain condition. The maximum strain in the concrete is 003. The distance to the neutral axis is little c. Distance to the steel is d. And epsilon sub t is defined down here. So epsilon t plus epsilon u together over the entire depth d is proportional to the concrete strain over the depth C, similar triangles. So that means that I can rearrange this. C over D is equal to epsilon U over epsilon T plus epsilon U. And I can plug in some numbers, 003 over 003 plus 0075 is 0.286. So where did I get the 0075? Well, that's what we assumed. We, we are targeting that epsilon sub t will be equal to 0075. So that's how I plugged it in here. So my c to d ratio is 0.286. Now, little a is equal to little c times beta 1. So a over D is equal to 0.286 times beta one, just made a substitution. And A is ASFY over 0.85 F prime C B. And rho is equal to AS over BD. So then I can make the substitution that A is equal to rho FYD over 0.85 F prime C, which is equal to 0.286 beta one D. Just made some substitutions here, right? So that means that my A is going to be equal to 0.286 beta 1 times D. Rho, then, let's see, how did I get here? I did, that's over FY. Uh oh. Oh, I solved for rho here. That's what I did. So rho is here and it's equal to 0 0.2. So I solve for rho in this equation to get that rho is 0.85 F prime C over Fy 0.286 beta one. Beta one in this case, if I plug in 6,000 PSI concrete is 0.75. 
So therefore, rho, and I can plug in my values, 0.85, 6 KSI, 0.286, uh, beta 1 is 0.75 over 80. So my target rho value is 0, 01367. Everybody tracking? Any questions? I have a question. Yes, please. Uh, will you always be giving the target? You will always be given a target. Yes. Yes. Uh, but not in real life. <laughs> oh, yeah, obviously. <laughs> not in real life. But uh, for these homework problems or an exam problem, yes, you'll be given some sort of a target. It may not always be epsilon t, but you'll be given some kind of a target so that everybody's guided down the same path. OK, thanks. Uh, which, which leads to an interesting question. What do we do in real life? Well, you could use a target like this in real life. There's absolutely nothing wrong with that. But at the advent of computers and software that is so fast, we actually do a lot more iteration in real life where I just make an educated guess. I start with 18, I plug in D equals to 24. I try some steel, I see what out comes out. Nah, this needs to be a little deeper. Okay, add a little more steel. You know, within five or 10 minutes, you have an answer. So iteration with software is a very valid way to do all this. But um, I'd rather go through the theoretical way to do it first. And then as you practice this, you could use the iteration to do some real world designs. I see. Thanks. Sure. OK, so we got to a row value. Um, Professor? Yeah. For the beta? Uh, beta 1? Yeah, you're only using that formula because we're in between 4,000 and 8,000, right? Yes, yes, okay. that's right. That's right. But if the PSI is different, uh, the beta one would be totally different as well. Yes. So if you had 4,000, 4,000 minus 4,000 is zero. So 4,000 is 0. 0.85. If you had 8,000, it's 0. 0.65. If you had 3,000, it's 0 0.85. If you have 10,000, it's 0 0.65. So anything below four is constant. Anything above oh. eight is constant. It's only between four and eight that you do this iteration. Oh, okay. I see that. Okay, thank you. Okay. All right. Now that we have a target row, we still can't just go row equals uh, or area of steel is equal to rho times B times D. We can't do that yet because we don't know what D is yet. But with a target rho found, we now need to find a desired D value. All right, so to do that, we're gonna go to our equation because we, we still haven't really, we based rho off of epsilon T equal to 0, 0, 0075. We haven't even introduced the load yet. So we have no idea how much steel we need or how deep the beam needs to be because we haven't even introduced MU yet. That's where this equation comes in. So we need to calculate our reinforcing index, R sub n, equal to MU over B, BD squared. But Rn is equal to rho Fy, one minus 0.59, rho Fy, F prime C. I have all of these numbers. I do not have all of these numbers. I don't have D squared, right? I have MU, I have B, but I don't have D. So I can't calculate this, but I can calculate this. So to calculate this part of it, I put in rho, 80 KSI, one minus 0.59, rho times 80 KSI over six KSI equals 0 0.976 KSI or 976 PSI. What does this equal? It equals this, right? So now I only have one unknown. 
Rn is equal to mu or phi bd squared. And so I can solve for d. d is equal to the square root of mu over phi Rn, phi b Rn, of which I have all my numbers. So 900 times 12 to get the inches, 0.918. And Rn, I just calculated, is 976, goes here. And I can solve for D. D needs to be 26.14 inches as a minimum. If I make a D less than 26.14, I'm not going to get the 900 kip feet with the row value that I chose. But I can make D greater than 26.14. That's OK. I just can't go less. OK, so the minimum is 26.14. Now, remember D is the distance from the top of the beam to the center of the reinforcement. So if I add 2 and a half inches, then I get a minimum height. Height is from the top to the bottom of the beam, where D is from the top to the center of the steel. So I'm going to add to D two and a half inches to get 28.64 inches. That's the minimum top to bottom height of the beam itself. Now, am I going to build a beam 28.64 inches high? Who here thinks I'm going to ask the carpenters to build me a beam 28.64 inches high? Is that big? 28.64, is that big? No. The precision, you mean? Yes. Oh. Yes. You ask a contractor to build the beams on your building 28.64 inches, you will be laughed off the job. Or they'll throw shovels at you, one or the other. No, you cannot ask them to build a beam of such a decimal type of thing. No, 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 no. In fact, you need to round it up to the nearest two inches or so. So you're going to choose 30 inches, not even 29 inches. You can't go with 28 inches because that's too small. That, that's less than your minimum. I would not go with 29 inches because that's still an oddball dimension. You're going to go with 30 inches. You ask the contractor to build you a 30 inch beam and they'll say, sure, no problem. We do 30 inch beams all the time. So see how this process works? I calculate what my index is. I use the index to calculate a minimum depth. I add to the minimum depth two and a half inches to get to a minimum beam height. This is my minimum. And then I choose something practical. I don't choose something practical on D because you don't choose how deep to make a beam based on D. You choose how deep to make a beam based on how deep the beam is. So I choose H equal to 30. Now that I have made this choice, everything else falls into play. If the beam is 30, see, now the D that I'm actually going to build, not D minimum, but the D that I'm going to build is 30 minus 2 and a half is 27 and a half inches. That's what I'm going to provide. It's more than my minimum, no problem, but that's what we're going to provide because that's what is practical. That's what's buildable. Now, with D at 27 and a half and my row value at the 0, 1, 3, 6, 7, now we can solve for how much steel I actually need. So I'm going to go, my required steel is row times B times D, 0 0.01367 times 18 times 26.14, and I need 6.43 inches squared of steel. That's my minimum steel. To get there, I'm going to choose six number tens. And this is where some of the, you know, the design comes in. 
right? I could have used uh, seven number nines. I could have used eight number sevens. I could have used five number 11s. There's a many different ways to get to the answer. I feel the most efficient answer is six number tens. So six times 1.27 inches squared gives me 7.62 inches squared. This is more than my required. So I feel pretty good about it. So let's go ahead and do our checks. So from this point forward, notice something. Notice something important. Now that we have an assumed depth of 27 and a half, and we have an assumed area of steel, 7.62 inches squared, the problem from this point down has become an analysis problem. The design part of it is done. We designed the D, we designed the AS, those were the two missing things. And now we just need to do our analysis. First thing, does six number tens fit in our 18 inch wide beam? I go to table 8.5, I look at my minimum width, and yes, just barely, but yes, those six number tens will fit in that 18 inch beam. Now we check our minimum steel requirement. AS minimum is three square root F prime C over FY or 200 over FY. Starting to pick up on a rhythm here, a pattern. So I calculate uh, my one minimum. I calculate my other minimum. I get 1.44 or 1.24. 1.44 controls. And I'm providing 7.62, not a problem. Now I need to check my maximum steel. I'm going to calculate epsilon sub t. So ASFY over 0.85 F prime CB. Plug in my numbers. I get 6.62 inches. Beta 1, as we already calculated, is 0.75. So C is 6.62 over 0.75 is 8.83 inches. Calculate epsilon sub t. And I have 27 and a half. Again, I'm not using the minimum D. I use the D that I'm providing. 27 and a half minus 8.83 over 8.83 is 00634. Notice here, it's greater than 005. So that's fine, that the beam works fine. And my fee is 0.9 as assumed. But notice that I was aiming for 0075. Why am I so far off from 0075? Any ideas? Is it because of C? Uh, um, no, no. Is it, can you go back one slide? I, I think it's there. Um, is it the A sum of 1.4 inches squared? No, it's not there. Mm -hmm. It's in here. All right, I'll tell you. The minimum D that we calculated is 26.14. And that minimum D came from the required load and the desire to have 0075. That's what's baked into this row factor. So that's where we got 26.14. But we're providing 27 and a half. It's a little deeper. A little deeper is always a little better. So that should make the epsilon to T value go higher than 0075. But then look what happened here. My required steel is 6.43. But just because I had to pick something practical and buildable, I needed to choose a rebar pattern that would fit 
and was practical. So I chose six number tens. Look how much greater the area of steel is that I'm providing than from what was actually necessary. We can do uh, 7.62 minus 6.43 divided 6.43. We're actually providing 19% more steel than is required. Why? Because I needed to pick something, right? Um, six number tens got me there. Six number nines would not get me there. So it's just a matter of modularity. It's a matter of picking something that fits. So this is the reason. The answer to my question is right here. I'm providing 19% more steel than I needed to. And that extra steel gives me a little bit more strength, but that extra steel brings down my epsilon sub t. Remember, more steel means less strain, right? And that's why we say there's a limit. You can't put too much steel in there or else the beam doesn't work because it's less than 005. So having six number tens as opposed to the area of steel that was the minimum is what brought this really down from 0.0075 to 0.0063. That's what happened. Okay, does that make sense? So professor, the more steel, uh, the, the beam will become like more brittle? That's right. Okay. That's exactly right. The more steel, the less ductility, right? Okay, but you do have to provide enough steel to meet your strength demand, right? So you're kind of hemmed in between those two constraints. You can't have too much steel, but you got to have enough steel to carry the load. All right, so that's what we just checked. That's what this check is, that I did not provide too much steel and I know that because I'm still greater than 005. So I'm okay. And my fee factor is 0.9. Now, the last step, as I've reiterated time and time again, you always recheck that you actually have the capacity that you need. So we use our VMN equation. We plug in the 0.9. And now make sure here that you plug in what you're actually providing not any uh, row factor or anything that you're calculating on the way. It, this equation doesn't care about how you got to six number tens. It, it, how you got there means nothing. Only thing that matters is six number tens. So six number tens goes here, 80. The D that you chose, not your minimum, goes here. Six number tens goes here. And you calculate 13,236 kip inch, which is 1,103 kip feet. 1,103 kip feet is greater than 900 kip feet. Therefore, my design is acceptable. In your entire four page calculation, this is the only line that matters. This is what I'm looking for. Okay? Well, I don't want to say that's the only line that, that matters. I am going to be checking that you've done your minimum steel check. I'm going to be checking that you did your maximum steel check and that you've checked that VMN is greater than MU. So we're going to be looking for all those. Any questions? Example number two. Okay. Um, yes. I have a question. Sure. For, can you go back to slide 226? Uh, tell me when I got there. I can't uh, see the yeah. slide. Okay. One more. Uh, when you're calculating the AS minimum, that one. Okay. So, well, when you compare the 7.62 inches squared, that is your required? No, no, that's your provided steel. 
of provided steel and then you compare it to the minimum yes right yes it doesn't make any sense to compare this required steel because you're not using the required steel. You're using the provided steel. You chose six number tens. So from, like I said, from this, here, let me do this. And, and I know you're, you're totally on the right track. You're totally getting this, but just for the edification of my point, from that line down, I have the only two things I was missing was D and AS. And from this line down, I know D and I know AS, right? And, 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 and I know what I chose. So I use the D that I choose, I use the AS that I choose. And from this line to the end of the problem is now an analysis problem. The design part of it is done. I know all of my variables. Now from that line down is just an analysis problem. And you'll see as I go through these examples that from this point down, I follow the same path every single time. Check the minimum width, check the minimum steel, check the maximum steel, check that I have enough strength. Same thing every time. Okay, that makes sense. And one more clarification, Professor. So when you find the minimum D, right, that's from the top and then the the center of the rebar. Yes. And then this two and a half inches, is it always two and a half? No. And that's a great question. If you think you can get all the steel in one row, then it's two and a half. But you may find that once you get to this point down here, what if I needed 10 number 10s? Well, 10 number 10s is not going to fit in 18 inches. So I need to move my steel to two rows. If I move my steel to two rows, then this two and a half is not valid anymore. It's going to be some, more like three and a half. But the, there, these problems, there is going to be some back and forth. You're going to assume two and a half. You're going to get to here. You're going to get to here and then say, oh, I need it in two rows. Okay, we'll go back, change this to three and a half, see what that did to this, change this, revise this, go down here, and you'll converge on an answer. But sometimes it takes a little iteration. Okay, and then lastly, the H minimum, the 28.64, that's from the top to the very bottom. That's right. Okay, because... I thought the two and a half is like, since uh, from the bottom to the center of the rebar, we have two inches over there, right? Uh, hold on, it's not working. Oh, wait, no, it's not given because you give us the, Never mind. I'm looking, I, I was thinking of a different, that was the other problem. Uh, That's yeah, right. the other problem. See, I didn't give you that. Yep. Okay, that makes sense. Okay. So if I don't tell you explicitly what that is, then you can assume it's two and a half, unless you have to go to two rows. Then D is measured to the center of the two rows, and that makes that a little deeper. Okay, that makes sense. Thank you. Okay, example number three. All right, so look what I did now. I don't know B, I don't know D, I don't know the area of steel. This is getting worse. So design a beam where the depth, the width, and the steel are all unknown. You don't know anything. So this time we're going to try to carry 800 kip feet a moment. You're going to use 5,000 PSI concrete. We're going to use 60 KSI rebar. And we're going to use, uh, we're going to use some text tables. Um, so we have to have a target again, right? 
you could just start throwing out numbers. And that actually is a very is is a valid design methodology. Uh, I, I I don't want to undervalue that. You can start with just your own engineering experience and say, you know, I think this should be about 20. So you start with 20. This that feels like 27. Okay, so if I use 20 and 27, how much steel do I need? 20 number tens. Uh, all right, well, let's make this wider and make that a little deeper. Now, what do I, okay? So iteratively, you can get to the right answer or you can get to a answer by doing that. But uh, again, to kind of guide us all in the same direction, we're gonna use these targets. So this time I'm gonna use a target that the width is about half the depth. That's my target. And epsilon sub t is gonna be greater than or equal to 0, 0, 0075. So with these two targets, I can then hone in three unknowns. B, D, and A, S are all unknown. Okay, so from table 8.7 for grade 60 rebar and F prime C equal to 5,000, I can get to a row of 0, 0162. How did I do that? I looked up 0, 0075 on the table and read directly 0, 0162. Okay, so that's how we got there very quickly. Now with a target row found, we need to find a desired D value. Okay, so you're gonna start seeing some patterns here. My reinforcement index R sub N is MU over phi BD squared. I don't know B, I don't know D, but I do know row FY one minus 0.59, row FY over F prime C. So I can plug in those values and I get an RN of 0.861 KSI. Rn is equal to mu or phi bd squared, which is equal to if I substitute b with half of d, so now I have mu over phi d over 2 times d squared. So I solve that's 2 mu over phi d cubed. And I solve for d, I get the third root of. 2mu over phi rn. And I can plug in my values now because I know what mu is. 12 for inches the foot, 0 0.9, 0 0.861 from here. And I get a d of 29.15. That's my minimum. Therefore, my minimum d is 29.15 leading to a minimum width of 14.58 because B was half of D. If I add two and a half inches for my minimum height, then 29.15 plus two and a half gives me 31.65. If I need 31.65 minimum, I'm going to go to the nearest two inches, which in this case is 32 inches. So, now I have a 32 inch beam. So my D is 32 minus two and a half is 29 and a half. That's my chosen D dimension. And with D at 29 and a half and my B minimum is 14.58, well, I'm gonna round that up to the nearest two inches, that's 16. So with row at 0 0.0162, D at 29.15, B minimum at 14.58, we can solve for our required steel. Okay, now here's a little bit of a nuance. Let me go back here a second. And this is a little different than the last example that I did. But if my minimum is 29.15, I chose 29 and a half. With my minimum width of 14.58, I chose 16. What can happen here is you're going to use AS is equal to rho times D times B. If you use rho times 29 and a half 
times 16, you may overestimate how much steel you need because the actual mathematical equations gave you these values as your minimums. So you wouldn't be terribly wrong to use your chosen D of 29 and a half and your chosen B of 16, but it's more accurate to use your minimums, okay? I'm just trying to explain that every time we're making these estimates, they add to each other and you're getting more and more conservative. So you could use your minimum D, not your chosen one. You can use your minimum B, not your chosen one, to size your area of steel. So if I do that, I find that my area of steel, I put in my minimums, gives me a better estimate of how much steel do I need, which is 6.89 inches squared. So again, I'm gonna choose six number tens, 7.62, because that's actually the closest thing to 6.89 inches squared. Per table, I need 17.95, I only have 16 inches. That doesn't work, no good. So I'm gonna adjust my width to 18 inches to make it fit. Okay, guys, see what I did there? I'm the designer. I was aiming for B equal to half a D, but it didn't work. So I just made a little adjustment. I went to the next two inches and said, okay, let's make it 18 inches instead. Okay. And I see that we're almost out of time. We're not gonna make it through this lecture, but let's get to the end of example three. We're almost there because from this point forward is just an analysis problem. Okay, so I have chosen my B, my D, and my area of steel. Now we're just in an analysis problem. I can go through this part a little quicker. My AS min is the greater of these two, 1.88. 7.62 is certainly greater than 1.88, so we meet the minimum steel requirement. Let's check our maximum steel. We know how to find A now, 5.96. Beta 1 for 5,000 PSI concrete from table A7 is 0.8. We know how to find little c, 7.45. Epsilon T then, substitute in. Now here you have to use uh, your chosen steel and your chosen D. This is what you're gonna build. So you have to use what you're gonna build here. That gives me 00888, which is greater than 005. So we are fine. V is equal to 0 0.9. Last step, calculate VMN. And I plug in my chosen area of steel, 60 KSI, 29.5, chosen area of steel. I get 10,884, which is 907 kip feet. 907 kip feet is greater than 800 kip feet. So therefore my design is acceptable. Okay, so we have one minute left. Oh, no, we don't. Anyway, who's got questions? I have a question. Sure. Um, why you assumed uh, B16 and not 15? Not 15? Yeah, because it's 14.5, so 15 is closer. You're right, it is. But generally speaking, and this is not hard and fast, this is not a rule, but generally speaking, forms are set up in two inch increments. Yeah, but for D, you didn't do too long. No, 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 no. D is not dictated by the form. D mm -hmm. is from the top of the beam to the center of the steel. That's not the form. For okay. H, I chose 32. H is the form. I see. See what I'm saying? The height of the beam has to follow the rules of the form work. D does not. 
because D is measured to the center of the steel inside. So it's B and H that have to follow to the nearest two inches. And then D is whatever D is based on what you chose for a beam height. I see. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? Uh, I have a question. Professor. Sure. Uh -huh. So we know since we checked that the width is not enough, right? Yes. And can you, instead of like adjusting the width, can you make it like a two row now? Yes, you can. Yes. But you'll need to change your minimum height. Yes, you will. Yeah. Is this is the three point five that you were saying now, right? Exactly. Yes. Okay. Yep. And I believe example four, we're going to do just that. I'll, I'll oh, show you how okay. to do that. And, but of course, that's we ran out of time, so we'll do that at the beginning of Thursday's lecture. Um, but I, I believe we're going to do that, and I'll show you how that works as well. Uh, but in this case, just by making the beam a little wider, we mm -hmm. got everything to work out okay. Okay, that makes sense. Okay, any other questions for me? All righty, as, as always, uh, I'll put this on YouTube tomorrow morning and we will see you on Thursday. Please don't forget your homework is due tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Um, professor. Yeah. All right. So for the last two uh, questions, you took uh, area of the steel as seven point sixty. While yes. you calculated it as seven point sixty two, you just rounded it. But is it? Ah, <laughs> uh, good question. Let me see. I mean, it's it is not it's such a big difference, but just. That is a good question. Six times 1.27. I believe the textbook table might give me 7.60. Maybe that's where I got it from. Uh, let's see, six number, no, that says 7.62. Um, <laughs> you know what that is? That's a typo. Okay, so because the last two questions, you did the same thing. So I was like, maybe he's doing it. <laughs> maybe you are doing it like uh, purposely or just um, uh, Did I do it on purpose? No, no, I think that's a typo. Okay, all right. Yeah. So thank you, thank you very much. I will fix it when I get a chance. Um, you are welcome. But um, so for the homework, I already submitted, you mentioned it. Although you told me that uh, I'm okay with the table use, but you also mentioned that the epsilon t I need to use, it's better. So um, can I resubmit it? Do you want me to just solve that way too, to show it? Or is it okay to leave it like that? I, I would leave it as it is, yeah. Um, unfortunately, Blackboard does not allow for you to resubmit. I think uh, you need to make an adjustment. If you can make an adjustment actually like twice that we can submit homework, it would be great because I, I do small mistakes usually and I didn't want to change it. <laughs> like, well, uh, then what I would suggest is, um, I mean, if you finish your homework like you did, that's fantastic. But maybe just wait until after the lecture and then submit it after the lecture, just in case I say something that makes you think of something. It's like, oh, you know. Hmm. But what you've described so far, I, I wouldn't bother resubmitting for that. It's all part of the learning experience, but it's not going to make any difference on your on your homework. Okay, thank you so much. Okay, you're welcome. All right, have a great day. Thank you. You too. Thank you. <laughs>